welcome everyone to our third and final day of our 20th anniversary gathering. It is, it has been incredible and I'm looking forward to uh, the discourse today. And so thank you all for taking the time to be here. I will begin with our territorial acknowledgement. Today we meet on the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. I come here in humility as a learner with deep gratitude for the opportunity to live, work, and gather on this land, the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Batoon, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is covered by the dish with one spoon, one pan belt covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe and the Lai nations to peaceably share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes. I recognize that some of us here are participating from different territories, and I invite you to silently in the chat, add where those territories are and to make acknowledgement in the same introspective and respectful spirit. I would like to now welcome Reverend Mary Fontaine to the stage. Reverend Fontaine is Cree from the Mistawesis and is ordained in the Presbyterian Church of Canada. She is the founder and executive director of Hummingbird Ministries, an indigenous led healing and reconciling ministry of the Presbytery of Westminster in British Columbia. Good morning or good afternoon, Mary, welcome. Good afternoon. Hi, hi. I'm um, going to start with a smudge prayer. I smudge in gratitude. I bring the smoke up to my eyes that I can see the true beauty of the world, so that I can see beauty in others and in myself. I bring the smoke up over my nose so that I can smell the freshness of Mother Earth and pray that all those who walk upon her do so in sacred manner. I bring the smoke up to my mouth so that I can speak with kindness and love. I bring the smoke up over my ears so that I can hear with compassion. I bring the smoke up over the top of my head so that my thoughts are not self-defeating, but instead honor my spirit and others' spirits as well. I bring the smoke up over my hair so that I am connected to my inner strength and resiliency so that I can walk with confidence knowing that I am loved by creator. I wash my hands with a smoke that what I touch is done with respect and honor. I bring smoke up over my arms so that I can use them to convey love. I bring the smoke up all over the front of my body and down my back to purify my energy so that I am open to the teachings that are meant to enhance my journey. I bring the smoke down towards my feet so that I can walk humbly and that my footsteps are guided in making a positive difference to the next generations. I bring smoke up to my heart four times to represent the four sacred directions in honor of my ancestors. I smudge in gratitude all my relations. I bring the four directions prayer as a blessing. And if you're able to um, look in the direction that I'm praying for, about, you may do so, or at least think about it. Creator, it is I. Thank you for, your, for today's sunrise, for the breath and life within me, and for all of your creations. Creator, hear my prayer and honor my prayer everyone facing east and imagine the pipe being raised to the east 
As the day begins with the rising sun, I ask, spirit keeper of the east, brother eagle, be with me. Fly high as you carry my prayers to the creator. May I have eyes as sharp as yours so I am able to see truth and hope on the path I have chosen. Guide my step and give me strength to walk in the circle of my life with honesty and integrity. Everyone facing south and the pipe is raised to the south. Spirit keeper of the south, wolf, be with me. Help me to remember to love and feel compassion for all mankind. Help me to walk my path with joy and love for myself, for others, for the four-legged, the winged ones, the plants, and all creation upon Mother Earth. Show me it is right for me to make decisions with my heart, even if at times my heart becomes hurt. Help me to grow and nurture my self-worth in all ways. Everyone facing west with a pipe raised to the west. Spirit keeper of the west, brown bear, be with me. Bring healing to the people I love and to myself. Bring into balance the physical, mental, and spiritual, so I am able to know my place in this earth, in life and in death. Heal my body, heal my mind, and bring light, joy, and awareness to my spirit. Everyone facing north with the pipe raised to the north. Spirit keeper of the north, white buffalo, be with me. As each day passes, help me to surrender with grace the things of my youth. Help me to listen to the quiet and find serenity and comfort in the silences as they become longer. Give me wisdom so I, may, so I am able to make wise choices in all things which are put in front of me. And when time for my change of worlds has come, let me go peacefully without regrets for the things I neglected to do as I walked along my path. And everyone facing back to the original. Mother Earth, thank you for your beauty and for all you have given me. Remind me never to take from you more than I need and remind me to always give back more than I take all my relations. Hi, hi. I'm going to say the Navajo prayer and then close with a little song. Great spirit whose voice I hear in the winds, whose breath gives life to all the earth, hear me. I'm a human being standing before you, one of your children. I am small and I am weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things you have made, my eyes sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise so that I may know the things you have taught my people, the lesson you have hidden in every leaf and rock. I seek strength not to be superior to my brothers, but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me ever ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes, so that the life fades as a fading sun, when life fades as a fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Amen. So this song is an honor song and it's um, giving thanks for life, for prayer and for, for grace.
ai me ho en kami ko ya hey ya hey ya hey ya hey yo kenan as ko tenan ke se man do ko ta we know get the mark so en kami ko ya get the mark so en kami was for healing. <clears throat> I think of the healing of the nations, the harmony of all the nations, and the vision that our people have for, for that to happen, that we will all gather around this great tree of life, very similar to the vision and revelation. <clears throat> all my relations, thank you and bless you, Kairos, for the work you've been doing for the past 20 years and that you plan to do for the next 20. God bless you, creator be with you. Our relations be with you as you walk, let us walk together. Hey, hey, thank you. As we move into the rest of the plenary this afternoon, first I want to mention that our artist Adriana Contreras is not available um, with us in person today. However, she will be still um, doing the graphic recording for us from the video that we are recording. So let me jump into the introduction of our moder moderator for this afternoon's panel. Nicholas Jessen has been the ecumenical and interfaith officer for the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Regina since 2017. After a similar role in the Diocese of Saskatoon for many years. Originally from Winnipeg, Nick studied philosophy and religious studies at the University of Manitoba and theology at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. He taught religious studies at St. Thomas More College, University of Saskatchewan for eight years. Nick is a former executive director of the Prairie Center for Ecumenism and has been a member of the Roman Catholic United Church of Canada Dialogue since 2012. Nick has been editor of the website Ecumenism in Canada since 1995, ecumenism.net. In 2010, he was asked by the Vatican and the Anglican Communion to develop the official digital archive of Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue. More recently, he has developed the Margaret Ogara collection of Canadian ecumenical dialogues for the Canadian Council of Churches. Nick is on the leadership team of Kairos Regina. Good morning, Nick, and welcome. Over to you, I hand it. Thank you, Aisha. That's, uh, um, as a first step, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you from Regina, which is located on Treaty 4 territory. Uh, that's the traditional lands of the Nahiowak, Nakawe, and Nakoda, and it's the homeland of the Dakota, Lakota, and the Métis peoples. Uh, so today is our, our third panel in this series. Uh, in the, the first two panels looked at the uh, where Kairos came from and where Kairos is at. Today, we look forward, where are we heading? Um, the, uh, I think we're all familiar with a, a famous quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the arc of history is long, 
but it bends towards justice. What we are asking our panelists today is to reflect on 20 years from now, where we might be as a society, as, as the world, and in particularly as people working in justice, and looking back upon these, these, this 20 year period from 2041 back to today, uh, we asked them to imagine uh, what type of world would you like to say you were living in in 2041 and what role did Kairos have in making this happen? Um, we also asked, said we are at a critical moment. Where do we go from here? What are our next steps? What is the role of our global partners, indigenous partners, the churches, migrants, the Canadian networks and more? So two, two questions for the panel. We have uh, four panelists today, um, and I will introduce them um, uh, now, um, one at a time as they, as they come, to these uh, are going to speak. Um, let me find my, my notes to make sure I've got them in order. Um, the, uh, we also have two respondents that will follow after that. So we have about 70 minutes assigned for this panel. Um, our first panelist is Natalia Atz Sunuk. She is a Maya Kachiko woman and a victim and survivor of the Guatemalan armed conflict. She's been a part of uh, social movements in Guatemala for over 30 years. Her areas of expertise are human rights, indigenous people's rights, food sovereignty, land and environmental defense, economic justice, climate justice, and free trade agreements. She was also an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. So, Natalia, I invite you to, uh, to respond to our questions. Bueno, muchas gracias. Buenos días. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate Kairos on this 20th anniversary, 20 years of work all around the world, 20 years of fighting to protect life, 20 years of fighting years of bringing different communities together and different lives together. 20 years of protecting life, not only the lives of human beings, but also nature. I would like to congratulate everyone who has made Kairos' work possible. Thank you for protecting Mother Earth. So now to the questions. How do I imagine the world how do I imagine society and the role that Kairos will play in the next 20 years? We want all communities to have access to well being. We want to protect biodiversity so that all living beings have a dignified life. We want a life of equality. We want there to be access to health and to food for all communities and healthy food especially. We want women to participate at all levels. Women have been very limited in their participation in society and in community. Those limits have been imposed on them and the youth have also had limited access. They have not had as many opportunities as others. So that's what we dream of, that's what I dream of, a life free of violence for all women and for all communities. We need to continue defending land, territory, and indigenous rights. They are the ones that have been on the front line. There are a lot of threats in terms of extractive industries, mining companies, metal extraction. They are invading our land and indigenous communities. This is having an effect on peace. And when those companies invade indigenous territory, that creates a lot of conflict for our communities. Therefore, we need to continue defending land and territory. We need to continue defending life. We need to continue fighting. We need to fight for 
food sovereignty. We need to protect life. When I talk about food sovereignty, I'm also implicitly talking about conserving the soil, how to strengthen and regenerate forests and nature and create a healthy environment for our communities. So we're also fighting for climate justice. The communities that are defending land and territory are also the ones who are most affected by climate change. We need to look at the cause and effect of climate change. We also have to identify those who are polluting Mother Earth. There are different levels of responsibility. One level of responsibility is when people, is when people don't manage waste accordingly or when transnational companies don't manage waste accordingly large industries also have a responsibility for example industries that produce plastic products we need to create awareness and we need to identify the responsibility of each actor and the impact that they have on climate change it's also important to strengthen community organization. There's so many risks that we face as the result of climate change. We need to raise awareness in our communities about these issues, not only just to raise awareness, but also to contribute. That way we can put a stop to climate change. I think that the role that Kairos can play and will play is very important. All of this work that needs to be done in terms of defending life. And here I refer to all life, not just human beings, but also nature, biodiversity, and all living beings. That's why I think Kairos' work in defending life is so important during the next 20 years. And I hope that everything Kairos does in the next 20 years will be strengthened. It's important to consider all these issues. These issues all pertain to life. It's an important mission. It's an important mission for Kairos to continue strengthening the rights of indigenous communities. They are the forgotten ones and the most affected in the context of capitalism, exploitation. Transnational companies are interested in exploiting Mother Earth. In countries such as Canada and in countries such as Guatemala, there's an important role to be played. Everyone has an important role to play. There's a lot of work to be done, not only in Canada, but in other countries as well. There's a lot of work to be done in the North, in countries in the Northern Hemisphere. We can raise awareness and mobilize, and there's a lot of work that we can do in our own countries, in Guatemala, where Canadian companies are present. There are also structural impacts that are a result of capitalism. There's a lot of work that we can do in Guatemala. We can raise awareness. We can participate, we can organize, we can defend human rights, we can promote human rights, women's rights, youth's rights, and community rights. And there's a lot of work to be done in Canada as well. That's where our fight, our struggle comes together. And the work that we do complements itself, each other. And if we work together, then we can achieve our goals. We want a dignified life. We want there to be equality and justice. And we also want to be free from oppression at all levels. I think those are important points that Kairos should have in mind for its mission, its vision, and for its goals for the next 20 years. I hope that Kairos will have enough energy and strength. We pray that it will to continue fighting during the next 20 years. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Natalia, um, a lot for us to think about. Um, our next speaker uh, is Gitsatanamuk, is uh, Wampanoag from the native community of Mashpee located on Cape Cod, south of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, he was one of five commissioners on the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and he taught for 10 years at the University of Maine's Orono, uh, or Orono campus as an adjunct, adjunct instructor and lect, lecturer in the Native American Studies and the Peace and Reconciliation programs. Presently, Gitsitanamuk is a member of the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle, the Kairos Initiated Climate Change Program, for the love of creation and a faculty member of the Upstanders Academy. He resides with his family at Eskenupati on the Burnt Church Reserve in occupied by New Brunswick, Canada. Thank you, it's Tenemuk. Please go ahead. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for your bravery of uh, speaking a little bit of uh, our language. Mane tukuna stahana wajiona nutahana wa moche kitabat ni kuna wajena nutabat anta munga shokizok kana wajone gumu kuna wajon nopeanta mae pita kuyung kash kana waje takilo kena wanto kasino takilo karas na sha na cha wajeno na wajeno na pamosho munga sha kana wajeno skuno wede skuno wajeno nto kasino kana takilo na uh, <clears throat> it is a great privilege to uh, to be here and to uh, uh, be able to share some some thoughts and a great deal of heart. Um, and I'm so privileged to um, to find myself here sharing thoughts and because uh, uh, I'm always wondering how I get here and 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 it must be saying something right and doing something right. And I want to acknowledge this wondrous family called Kairos. It's such, it's been such a privilege to be part of the indigenous rights circles and then to meet uh, other indigenous representatives. Um, uh, and I, I think about uh, Lee and I think about uh, Ginger and, um, and so many others that I've come to learn who have been also indigenous participants of Kairos. Uh, I'm not all, uh, I'm, I'm not working from any script, but I thought I had to take a little time to share some thoughts and, and I wrote them down and I provided to uh, Kairos uh, these written uh, thoughts. Uh, so hopefully they'll, they'll be available to to anyone who wishes to review them. Two things that I want you to remember from what I can contribute on. And, and I'm so grateful that uh, to hear from Natalie and, um, and uh, from Mary, because they had, they have said it all, you know, and, and I'm just uh, providing maybe footnotes uh, to what's already been said. And I've been so honored to listen in to the presentations uh, throughout this week. And I'm, I'm, um, it occurs to me that what, was, what came here uh, principally from Europe uh, to the Americas uh, is still being played out. You know the doctrine of discovery and 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 how that came to be and formulated. It's still being played out in the world today, as we saw uh, in in previous um, uh, presentations. You know, particularly today in, in the struggles in Madagascar and in uh, the DNR. You know, this is uh, this this is the uh, the doctrine of discovery being played out before our eyes. And so when we begin to, you know, process our faiths, you know, I, I think in, in terms of responsibility that we're all responsible. And when I think about uh, the future ahead, you know, what does it look like 40 years from now? 
I'm left with two basic truisms. One, we are more than what we've become. We are far, we are far more than what we and where we are now. In fact, I think as human beings, we have yet to realize our full human capacities and potential. Uh, and when we when we align ourselves to creation and to that divineness that's all around us and within us, you know, we manifest what needs to be done and where we should be. The other axiom I want I want you to remember <clears throat> is that despite all the, the struggles and challenges that brought Kairos to this space, to this place in history, Kairos for me represents the Canada that we need to be. You know, it exemplifies the embracement of, of indigenous voice. Um, and the reality is that, that we are living in somebody else's homeland. When we, when we bravely acknowledge the territories of where we lived on, all these territories are unceded territories. We didn't give we didn't give any lands away. We don't have the right privilege to do that. And our treaties provided a space for what's now Canada. When we honor the treaties, we honor the space where we live in. And we all have responsibilities to the land. Um, and, and I keep hearing, you know, that the, the, the current strata of, of struggles that we're all talking about that we're all providing, you know, 40 years from now, we've made an effort, you know, to de-escalate the, the, the meanness that's around us, you know, the, that corporations are finally becoming responsible for what they're doing, you know, and, and frankly, the, 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 uh, the resources that we're, we're extracting from the earth, I don't think we really need those resources. We're fueling a, a kind of economy that is, well, let's say capitalist economy is probably the, the, the most destructive form of economy that's ever existed among human beings. And there are other forms of economy that are more responsible. The, I, the ideology of money, you know, uh, has, has translated our, our living to, to a, a level of, of indignity to all life. And I think that we can find different ways of, of responsible economy that nurtures life. Um, you know, and as was said earlier, you know, both Mary and, and Natalia mentioned earlier that, that there's a responsibility that comes with, we take what we need. And in that taking, we have ceremony we just don't go out and take. We have a responsibility uh, to understand that we're taking life, you know, and, and that life is out there to help us. The earth is out there to help us. So how do we get there? You know, Kairos has, uh, has embraced a methodology, a human methodology of, of creating a pathway that we all work together to consciousness. And it's a beacon for other organizations that Kairos has aligned itself with, you know, and it's applying our faith to practice, not just what we pray for, but how we live our lives. You know, and, and, I, and I'm so thankful to, to, to be here and to share those, you know, because when, when we speak, uh, when we align ourselves to creation, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an owl. Uh, I live in the house of otters and turtles. You know, it's impossible for my culture, for myself, for my nation and confederacies uh, to exist without, without that express connection to the earth. And that is a deep, profound, a, a deep love for all the life that's around us. And I, uh, and it's my, uh, my work and the work of Kairos. You keep hanging with us, keep hanging with Indian country. You know, we'll all get to where we need. You know, uh, as uh, the doctrine of discovery is still being played out, it forms the, 
the national values that we have and the in the false narratives that we believe had were true but are not um like indian country um we are sovereigns as well as every every living thing on this earth every living being and it eventually if canada remains uh and and follows the lead of kairos and the other two million organizations out there who are doing wondrous things with economic and environmental justice in hanging with indigenous peoples and the 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 the, the foundation of indigenous peoples that come from a matriarchal culture you know it is the women who lead the women who are closest to the relational of the sacred of the earth you know women are the daughters of the earth and we follow as men we follow their direction and their wisdom and i feel that this is where canada needs to become a matriarchal society as well as the united states and all and as well as all these so called democracies that are around us we need to 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 take that that feminine perspective the divineness of of life around us uh so i want to conclude with a piece of of non evidence i can't prove this but it runs through my veins and i see it all around us i see what creation is talking to us about always trying to get our attention there's something on the horizon and it's coming to us and it's coming to us with a, a a purpose an intention that despite all the meanness and all the the degradation that goes around us the the divine is coming to us and is coming to us in deep patterns of love and connection and uh and i see that in the in the 40 years that uh um that i'm able to uh project that we are coming very close to that divine love and this is the way that we have to live our lives this is the way that our nation states have to evolve into uh into this great circle of families you know family to each other family to earth family to creation and so with that thank you for this privilege you know jayana don't us no thank you very much gets a ton of book um and very uh encouraging words and uh uh we'll have a chance to reflect on those a little bit uh with the responders later as well. We're going to take a break here now. It's in the middle of our panel which is this is to give our translators a bit of a pause. Um and uh we're going to receive the gift of another song from the Michi Singers of Toronto Urban Native Ministry uh who graced us yesterday. Uh the song is Eagle Song. Um Shannon, are you ready? Good morning. My name is Charlene. My spirit name is Red Bear. Um we're the Nietzsche Circle singers. Um the next song we are going to be singing is a eagle song and it comes from South America and it's to bring all indigenous people together. <laughs> Oh, 
That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I don't know if our uh, our translators will be back yet, but we're going to begin again. Uh, our next presenter is uh, next panelist is Stacy Gomez, who is a migrant justice organizer with No One Is Illegal from Halifax, Kajipok uh, uh, Migrant Workers Program. The program engages in outreach, accompaniment, public education, and advocacy in solidarity with migrant workers in Nova Scotia. Uh, no One is Illegal Halifax is a, also a community partner with Kairos's, Kairos Canada's Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers During COVID-19 Project. Stacey has been engaged in advocacy and solidarity with human rights defenders in Guatemala and throughout the Americas, and she is a member of Kairos's Ecological Justice Circle. Welcome, Stacey. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be part of this uh, important conversation. And um, I always welcome the opportunity to think about um, what our future, collective future together can look like. I think oftentimes, uh, maybe my, myself and, and others, maybe sometimes we're very focused on what we're doing um, currently, um, so it's it's good to to think um, more uh, broadly into the future. Um, in this case, in twenty years, um, and so uh, I appreciate the opportunity for reflection. Uh, so I would like to see uh, that we are living in a vibrant world where migrants are recognized as full members of our community and communities across across these territories and uh, being treated fairly. Um, so one major issue uh, that is faced um, by uh, people in our communities is inequality based on immigration status, which is rooted ultimately in racism. Um, because for example, we know that um, for some people from, from certain countries, <laughs> of certain demographics um, have a easier time uh, being able to, to cross borders. Uh, and yet, uh, for people who are uh, racialized, including uh, migrant workers here in Nova Scotia, uh, in unceded Mi'kmaq territory, uh, we have uh, migrant workers predominantly from Mexico and Jamaica. And so, uh, through these uh, work programs, um, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, uh, workers uh, come work here, are here for the majority of the year. Some have been coming for as many as up to 30 years, uh, and yet they're still considered temporary residents. And they do not have uh, opportunities uh, to stay as permanent residents. Um, so this is a major uh, challenge. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, so when they come to work in Canada, uh, they're separated uh, from their families uh, in their home communities. Um, and I also want to say, um, you know, in talking to workers, we know that people have multiple homes. <laughs> so here is a home for migrant workers. Um, also, uh, in, in their uh, countries of origin, that's also a home uh, for migrant workers. But some say, I'm here the majority of the year. This is my home. <laughs> but uh, yet they're not able to stay uh, due to our immigration policies. Uh, and also uh, they pay benefits like employment insurance, but when the season is over and they return home to their home country, uh, they cannot access regular employment insurance benefits. Um, so these are some of the um, issues that uh, migrant workers uh, raise uh, when, we, when, we talk to, when we talk to them. Uh, and I'm sure that Connie also talked about this in her presentation as well. Um, and when the rights of migrant workers are violated, um, or if uh, they're being abused, they have to make a difficult choice, uh, whether to speak out or, or not. Uh, and this is a difficult decision because if they speak out, they risk being fired, return to their uh, country of origin, and uh, potentially not being able to come back on the program. Uh, so many workers come here to provide not only for themselves, but also their families. And so that is a very difficult decision to make. Uh, and in this uh, situation, a lot of the power is in the hands of the employers. Uh, and so, um, yes, this is a, 
a, a difficult situation for, uh, for workers. So migrant workers, as well as other migrant communities throughout, the, uh, throughout these territories, have been calling for full and permanent immigration status uh, for decades now. And it's because of migrant organizing that we have seen some changes. Um, for example, uh, this year, the government announced the temporary resident to permanent resident program, which was uh, kind of historic. Uh, it was really a first opportunity uh, that many migrant workers had to be able to apply for permanent residence. But unfortunately, there were too few spots open and too many barriers. Uh, for example, uh, people had to do uh, language tests that uh, were very uh, diff difficult to find uh, spaces open. Um, and also uh, just uh, in general, uh, uh, very uh, stringent. Uh, and so also in the past few years, the government announced the uh, there is a program uh, called the Vulnerable Worker Open Work Permit, um, where uh, migrant workers experiencing abuse can apply for the possibility of being able to work somewhere else, uh, somewhere safer. But they have to submit a lot of evidence and they can still be denied. Uh, and so this is not a solution either, um, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, as I say, like, you know, no one goes to work. I mean, people often do not uh, go to work. Uh, thinking I'm going to be abused, let me document this. It's, it's challenging to have uh, evidence uh, when you're being abused. Uh, so uh, yes, so we echo the calls uh, of migrant workers for full and permanent immigration status. Uh, this is an issue that comes up uh, again and again in our conversations uh, with migrant workers. Uh, and so as a result, uh, migrant workers are vulnerable members of our communities. Uh, and one key issue that we see is food insecurity. Uh, despite the fact that migrants feed the world, uh, we're seeing migrants going hungry in our communities. And so one part of the work uh, that we have been able to do, uh, thanks to funding through the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers during COVID-19 uh, partnership with Kairos, uh, is to be able to provide um, food boxes. Um, in addition, we also had a seedling project where we invited members of the community to grow uh, seedlings of uh, plants uh, that people would, uh, would find back home, uh, Mexico and Jamaica. And we had a really great response from the community. Uh, lots of community members participated. Uh, we were really happy to see the results of it. And so in general, I would like to see, I would like to live in a community where migrant workers are not going hungry where they do not have to make the decision between eating well themselves or sending money home for their families to eat well, where they're not separated from uh, their families. And I would like to see um, more, uh, more communities with more community dinners and migrant worker gardens and just vibrance, uh, more vibrance. <laughs> and um, another, another aspect that we do see also and uh, in in my work uh, in supporting migrants, one thing that we've one thing that I've been engaged with, and our group has been engaged with, is anti deportation campaigns. So we see uh, families being uh, torn apart uh, by deportations, uh, and so I would like to live in a world uh, where where this is not the case, uh, where families can again be together, uh, and I would ultimately. Uh, like to see a, uh, a world where people and communities are not divided by borders, which is what we're seeing now. And we know that um, that borders have not always existed, <laughs> that borders are colonial. Uh, and, so, and, you know, we see that there are often spaces where violence uh, is enacted to enforce borders. Um, and I would say, uh, I think Kairos has a very important role to play. So we've seen, uh, for example, through the uh, Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers during COVID-19 uh, partnership, uh, that Kairos has been able to partner with uh, some smaller organizations, uh, some grassroots organizations that are um, directly uh, doing this work on the ground, that are building these relationships with migrant workers and community members uh, across in our case, across the province, 
And I think this is a really important uh, contribution um, because uh, I can't, I don't have a tally of uh, all of the work that we've done this year, but uh, as was mentioned, we've reached over 1300 people. We regularly uh, are contacted by workers experiencing abuse uh, and we talk to them about the different options that exist. And uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, this work has really uh, been able to grow uh, through the support that we've received uh, through this partnership. Uh, so we definitely uh, do uh, value the important work that's taking place. Um, and we see that this work is also taking place um, in, in different territories as well. Um, I think with uh, similar stories. And I also think in terms of Kairos's role is also continuing to push for these bigger changes uh, that need to happen. Uh, and so uh, I would say in terms of what's what's next, I would say that we just keep building and keep pushing and keep fostering friendship and mutual aid with our neighbors, uh, regardless of their racial background, regardless of their immigration status. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Um, our next panelist is uh, Jessica Steele, uh, who is a climate justice activist ocean conservationist and youth engager, striving to tread lightly and with intention on the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people. She has a BSc in biology with a specialization in marine biology from University of Victoria. Uh, she's done an international youth internship placement in Senegal. She is now the senior referrals analyst with the uh, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, where she upholds Indigenous rights through consultation on environmental assessment projects. Uh, she also sits on the uh, Primates World Relief and Development Fund National Youth Council and has been the PWRDF representative to the Kairos Ecological Justice Circle since 2018. And that's not enough. She also attended COP24 on behalf of Kairos. Um, welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Kairos for having me um, on this panel. I, I really appreciate it. And I am um, really honored to be able to sit here and listen to all of the other panelists and, um, and Mary Fontaine and be able to, to learn from them as well. Um, as I'm thinking about maybe what I, I can bring to this panel, um, thinking of the idea of footnotes, um, as Gitsatana Muk said, um, I think the perspective and from my experiences, um, I'm gonna try to bring a bit of a perspective of youth, um, even though I'm slowly reaching the point of aging out of the youth category, and then a perspective on climate change, um, because that's been a lot of my work. So when thinking about climate change, we're at a breaking point. Um, we either need to decide to take drastic action for a sustainable world, or we're gonna continue to suffer the consequences, une unequally of course, but suffer the consequences of a two degree or three degree world. And so when I was asked to reflect on the future, um, it's actually quite scary to think of a future when you think of the climate crisis, scary to think of where we could be in 2041. And I, like many people, I think feel a lot of overwhelm, a lot of exhaustion, a lot of climate anxiety, compassion fatigue, and just worry for what future generations are gonna look like. And because we're at this critical moment, I think some of the biggest challenges that we're gonna face over the next couple of years um, is to try to remain hopeful, um, to try to take care of ourselves and to take care of others so that we don't burn out in this work and to really keep fighting for really ambitious climate action. I, um, I was on Twitter this morning, just looking at a few tweets and I saw a youth activist who wrote, um, it is evident that some politicians think that acting to save my generation is too difficult to even attempt. And that was a bit of a reflection on some of the new climate policy um, and new initiatives that are coming out. And I thought that was really poignant because when people's lives are at stake, when nature is at stake, um, flora and fauna are at stake, like wouldn't we wanna do everything that we can, even if it seems unachievable, wouldn't we wanna do everything that we can? Um, we can't just give up now and just accept that we'll be definitely living in a two degree world or a three degree world when the IPCC has shown us um, the significance and importance 
of making sure that we stay below 1.5 degrees. And I think it's important that we think of climate delay and the privilege that comes with, with responses around climate delay. It's a pretty privileged response to think that um, it's okay for us to wait and that maybe we can go to a two or three degree world. So I think that one of the, the best ways to stay hopeful and like to keep advo advocating for climate justice um, from my perspective is really to make space for youth and youth voices. Um, we need to meet the ambitious expectations of young people um, instead of discrediting them and saying, oh, we can't do it. We need to meet those ambitious expectations because those youth just want to live in a planet um, which is going to be safe for them and for their children and for their grandchildren. So I was, and I think one of the, the ways that I was reflecting on this is, um, as Nick said, I was really lucky and privileged to be um, a representative for Kairos at COP24, which is the UN Climate Change Conference. Um, and that happened in Krakow in, in Poland in 2018. And while I was at COP, um, I found the, the difference in, in energy and, oh, for sure, I, I think I'm speaking a bit too quickly. Um, I found the difference in energy and idealism and urgency in youth climate activists and youth climate leaders that were present at the COP um, compared to some of the state leaders that were dragging their feet, that were finding excuses as to why they couldn't make ambitious climate pledges, that were finding excuses as to why they couldn't contribute to loss and damage, and that we're saying things like, we, we can't do a fast transition. Um, we can't change that quickly. Um, that we need oil, we need gas, we need coal over the next 30 years. And that was really striking in the climate negotiations. Well, then you saw in the side events, um, which were often led by youth and often led by indigenous youth and led by youth in the global south, um, like the South Island developing states. And they just kept saying that there's such an urgency in the climate discussions and the climate crisis, um, reminding us that there is so much information and tools out there for us to be able to justly transition to a renewable energy economy that we can change, we just have to make the decision to change and that the world has always changed. We live in a world that evolves. And so we just need to evolve and we need to do it quickly because we've delayed it for so long. And I think the other striking thing about um, that conference in particular was that it's the world leaders, the ones that are dragging their feet that are in the negotiating rooms and they're the ones creating policy. They're the ones making the climate pledges. It's not these vital youth voices. And so I think re reflecting on the future, um, we really need to follow the voices of youth um, so that in 2041, we're in a world that is radically transformed, a world that's gonna look really different than the world that we live in now but that's what we need. And that's what we need by 2041, ensuring that no one is left behind. And it's, it's a huge hurdle. I see it as this, these huge barriers in front of us. Um, but deep down, I have to believe that we can do it. We've overcome significant challenges in the past, whether it's wars, whether it's economic downturns, whether it's um, the feat of developing a vaccine for a global pandemic. And it's been far from perfect and it's been far from equal. Um, but I think that's what we need to strive for is the idea of how can we create this, this world in the future, which has a just energy transition and that really is leaving no one behind. And so I don't really have the answers of how to do that or how do we go from here. Um, but I think one of those things is community. And that's when I think of Kairos as Kairos as an organization that brings together um, lots of churches to come together and think about a faithful climate response. And I think that's really important that we can work together in community. I think we need to make space for youth. I think we need to make space for youth voices and not in a tokenistic way in the way where we're, 
we're just giving them a platform, but in a way where they actually have decision-making power and they actually have influence over um, the direction that, that organizations and the direction that policy is taking. I think that we need to listen to Indigenous land defenders who've been on the front lines for, for very, very long time and who have the solutions for us to be able to get out of this climate crisis. And then I, I think the, the term is a bit of a buzzword now, this term intersectionality, but it's really important to consider that the, the climate crisis, we need to be thinking of those who are most vulnerable, those whose voices have been silenced when we're trying to come up with solutions and as we're moving forward um, with all of our next steps. Because of course the, the climate crisis is just this, this large amplifier of every other social justice issue. So I know that that feels like a lot. And I think I often get very overwhelmed by all of this when I think about what we need to do today and what we need to do over the next 20 years and how do we get to, um, to a place in 2041 um, where everyone is safe and everyone um, yeah, is able to live in a safe world and a safe environment. And when everything gets a little bit too, I think existential for me or a bit too, too big for me, I try to come back to um, the ideas that come out of Adrian Marie Brown's work around emergent strategy. And um, this work was shared to me by um, a dear friend who passed away in 2019, Danielle Moore. And Adrian Marie Brown says that how we are at the small scale is how we are at the large scale. So essentially the approach is that small actions and connections that we create um, here in our local communities, those create complex patterns that become ecosystems and become societies and become our world. And I think it's this really beautiful idea um, of fractals, which is the idea that, yeah, what we're doing here in our communities, our churches, our families, um, local partnerships with Kairos partners, that reverberates to large scale and large change. And Adrian says this and then goes on to give examples in nature saying that the fingerprints on our fingers are the same spirals and the same circles as what we see in galaxies. And the veins in our bodies are the same branching veins as what we see in river tributaries or even what we see in lightning. And I think it's a beautiful imagery when we get really overwhelmed by these existential crises that um, things at the small scale matter because they do um, amplify up to the largest scales. So while the future is scary, I think um, it's also exciting. I think there's lots of opportunity for, for peace and for collaboration and for justice and for innovation. And I saw this again on, on I think, a social media recently, which was like, I hope that I can sit down and tell my kids and my grandkids of a time when we used coal and oil and extractive industries and they won't believe me. They'll, they'll see a totally different world. Um, and that I think would be my dream to be able to, to make it seem like, oh no, that didn't happen um, in a way that we're able to, to totally flip, flip our world just for the better. So I think I'll just say thank you. Yeah, so much to Kairos once again. Um, I think we're all so important in, in taking these next steps over the next 20 years and all the members of Kairos are also very important, um, whether it's local front frontline action or whether it's pushing for policy changes, um, capacity building in your communities, having conversations with your neighbors, um, and I just hope that in all of that work that we're really able to keep um, the voices and, and, and the thoughts and the concerns of young people um, in our hearts and minds as, as we make um, decisions over the next 20 years. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, and um, you know, as you were talking at the beginning about how um, you get, you know, youth want, 
action, but we have a sense that the politicians and others uh, are not are not acting. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to attend the opening of the Saskatchewan Legislature um, and heard the throne speech, and there was a perfect example of politicians not listening and acting. Um, I shouldn't say anything more about that right now. Uh, instead, we're going to move uh, to the respondents, um, people who have a challenging task of responding to what they've just heard. Um, and uh, so our first respondent is Emily Blair. Emily has coordinated the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability since 2012. This is a coalition of 38 environmental and human rights NGOs, faith-based organizations, labor unions, and solidarity groups that advocate for Canadian law and policy reform uh, to require companies to prevent human rights and environmental damage throughout their global operations and to ensure that those harmed by Canadian business operations can access remedy in Canada. Welcome, Emily. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you uh, to all the panelists so far. It is not <laughs> an, an easy or undaunting daunting um job to be to be responding to that i just i i have to share all of the panelists uh, expressions of gratitude not only to kairos for for bringing everyone together but also for for the words that that you you've shared that really resonated um i'll try and pick up just some of the pieces of uh, that i i found most impactful in in what we heard already today um, at the beginning, uh, just the kind of smudge prayer and other prayers I found really moving. moving. Um, and, and I think that they resonated in particular um, because the struggle that we are engaged in to stand up to corporate power is one that is often thankless <laughs> and seems to be going nowhere. Uh, I Those of you who are on our mailing lists get have have received the calls to kind of one more time, <laughs> just call your MP now, we'll see a change. And I think our, our movement is still is still reeling from having made some steps forward and really thought we, we had gotten something and realizing that that impact hasn't been as significant as as, as we were there. So I, I think kind of our, our movement needs both the, those those healing prayers and the, and the strength offered by them. Um, and I think that also when Jessica uh, was speaking about the the importance of overwhelm and exhaustion uh, in the in the climate context, I think that 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 uh, resonates in other areas too. Um, and part of what we need to be doing is finding spaces to to come together like this to celebrate the small victories that we're having, the small steps we're making. We have. Uh, I think been making a really significant impact in in the work that that we're doing and the spaces that we have right now um, to come together. And I think also lifting up what Jessica was saying around uh, wouldn't we all wouldn't we want to be do everything we can when people's lives and the environment are are at risk? And I think that that's something that we should be <laughs> bringing to to all of our meetings and 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 all of our our statements because it is a time for for us all to be quite quite ambitious. Kids of Tanamuk, I I share your gratitude for the for the wonderful space that this thing, this space, <laughs> this community that is Kairos. Um, and I'm always impressed with uh, the extent of, of community uh, around um, that, that's been created here. I think one of the things that that was making me think about is, is a hope in the future for there to be greater, even greater connections between the corporate accountability movements in Canada and around the world. Um, and, and gratitude again to Kairos for, for what we're doing there. I wanted to pick up on, on what he was saying around, do we really need to be taking all these resources out of the ground that we are? And I think also going back to what Jessica was talking about around climate action, that when we're looking at, at corporate accountability, there's really huge implications for this moment that we're in, um, for a transition to uh, a green, sustainable, just uh, framework. A lot of the time people are talking about a shift to electric cars and there are lots of questions that we need to be asking there about whether the battery components for those cars 
Are they coming from recycled materials or are they coming from components that have been extracted without regard for, for rights and the, and the environment? Are we trying to solve one climate problem um, by creating uh, pro human rights and environmental implications elsewhere? Um, has due consideration been given to alternatives to the electric car car in the first place? So I think that those are all things that I'm, I'm hoping we will have, have, have resolved as, as we move forward. Um, and, and moving back to some of Natty's comments around um, who bears the responsibility for this. We often focus on consumers buying fair trade and ethically produced goods, which is all, um, it is something that we, we need to and it, it take on our individual responsibility, but ultimately we need a, a systemic transformation where those companies who are involved in human rights and environmental harms have to prevent those harms and where the Canadian government isn't, isn't uh, complicit in supporting and financing uh, those, those corporations. So I think um, deep appreciation for, for, this, for this space and this, and this time um, and I look forward to working with all of you over the next 20 years so that um, we're seeing greater respect for human rights and the environment um, by corporations. Thank you, Emily. Um, and our last, our, our second responder, uh, our last speaker for the day is uh, Janet Gray. Uh, Janet has been involved in ecumenical justice work since the 10 days for global justice times. Um, and she finds her home in the justice and relationship building uh, focus of Kairos. And this is, uh, and this is what her faith means to her. Uh, she lives on Lekwungen territory uh, of the Skianu nation, also known as Victoria. I'm sorry about that and is passionate about my pronunciation, and she's passionate about doing what she can to leave this beautiful, diverse Mother Earth in better shape for healthy future generations of all beings. Welcome, Janet. Thank you very much. I, I am honored to be here as a responder today, and I am grateful for the Kairos Network where I have found a home. I am grateful to all the speakers, Lisa Tanamook, to Mary, to Natty, to Emily, to Jessica, and to Stacy. Thank you to all of those of you that are listening here today. I am speaking from the Lekwungen speaking people's territory of the Sianu First Nation on the West Coast. I want to thank Mary for her beautiful words of, um, and blessings for us to start in a good way. To begin my time, I want to share a few words of gratitude as well. For this is what I have learned as part of my time as a volunteer in Kairos over these many years. I share my gratitude for the big leaf maple. I share my gratitude for the Gary Oak, and I share my gratitude for the Douglas fir. I light a candle to remind me now of the words of Jesus and his teachings who have inspired and guided me in my life and is at the center of the faith groups that come together as Kairos. We are living in critical times. I have heard the importance of the aha moments right now from our speakers. The importance of understanding the gravity, but also the light and opportunity. As we celebrate 20 years of Kairos, we have heard these words. We have heard these words over and over again that all life is connected. For the next two weeks, I will take part in the For Love of Creation ecumenical de uh, delegation witnessing and taking part at COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, like Jessica did a few years back. 
This gathering of global leaders, politicians, business and civil society is perhaps our last chance to really make the commitments we need to see to bring our climate within what we hope will make for a livable future. These are indeed critical times and moments and we have heard Cairo speak of this over and over again today from our speakers. From indigenous leaders and knowledge keepers like Gisa Tanamuk, Nadi, and Mary, we have, a, we have heard that we have a responsibility to protect and defend life for all. For the youth, for the youth like Jessica and many others that are not yet born, we have that responsibility. I have deep respect for all the land defenders, forest protectors and water guardians that we have heard from and that I have come to meet over the years who stand up against the machinery of the status quo and say enough is enough when it comes to injustice for the people on this earth. I am grateful that Kairos made the effort and saw the importance of the global connection to have Nadi made one of the honorary witnesses to the Vancouver TRC Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2013. What a gift her words were to all who heard her then and again today. I have learned how courageous she is to speak out at all, yet she and other global partners do again and again. As she said today, we all have a role to play in defending life for all of creation. We Canadians, we in the churches, we in coalitions, we individuals, we as Kairos have the freedom to speak out about injustices and the right to peaceful dissent. Yet we see these rights being sorely tested on the front lines in old growth logging and fossil fuel pipeline expansions to name a few. Kairos must stand for the rights to witness and peaceful dissent for, to, to witness and for peaceful dissent here and globally with our partners. I want to lift up the speakers today again and to the friends of Kairos here at home in BC to name just a few who stand up like Chief Roland Wilson of West Moberly First Nation, Helen Knott from Proffer River, and those others standing against the Sightsee Dam, to those fighting the expansion of fracked gas, to Elder Bill Jones of the Pachadat Nation and all the youth and older people who continue to stand with the ancient trees that are being logged right here at Ferry Creek. To Ruth, Jeanette and all those standing against the TMX pipeline expansion. To Hannah House Manual and all the tiny house warriors on Schwetmack territory defending their land and water. Kairos is a way of amplifying and giving support to their voices. Yes, these are critical times and it is easy to be scared or frightened. I too am scared, Jessica. I am grateful for your honest words about where you are and what you feel. We must not hide from the truths that are difficult to hear or pretend we are not part of the solutions and road ahead. We are called to seek justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly. These are indeed Kairos moments, and we are all being called forward into these next decades to share widely what we have learned from our past. The Kairos ex blanket exercise has been a wonderful example of the transformational changes that any settler who has participated can attest to, change that has occurred not just in, the in their minds, but in their hearts. The KBE did not start off by sweeping across the country, it started slowly. New growth comes from our willingness to take risks and to be bold and courageous with our voices and actions. It is not a smooth path or easy. We must make radical changes to everything we are part of and listen to and act on what the youth of today are calling us to do and be. The relationships made in Kairos, the resilience and strength I have learned from partners, both locally, nationally, and globally, have shown me hope and given me the strength to persevere. Kairos is called to stand up with, uh, stand up 
with and for others in all of creation and to work for a reconciling world where we become true again, as Paul mentioned yesterday, or as Gisa Tanamuk says, to live into divine love and the powers that we have as small players where together we are powerful and make, can make the differences we want to see in 2041 come true. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, and thank you, Emily and Janet have both uh, effusively thanked our panelists already, but I, and I just want to make those uh, thanks my own as well. Um, the, uh, the panelists' reflections and our two respondents have made a uh, very thoughtful for many of you. Um, that's, uh, that's quite important. Uh, and uh, I can't underestimate the importance of your contributions. I'd also like to thank the interpreters, uh, both the, uh, the audio interpreters and those on the chat that are interpreting for us. Uh, that has been uh, really good too and a very important part of this communication. Um, as we wrap it up, our, we turn now to uh, Aisha Francis, who is going to offer us a reflection on where we are going from here. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you so much, Nick. Those uh, responses and the panelists were incredibly powerful um, and certainly speak to our responsibility for the construct and condition of this world. So thank you all for, for participating today as we talk about where we're headed to. So unfettered, this was the first word that came to my mind as I thought about where we are headed to unfettered, not controlled or restricted, free, unrestrained, unbridled. I thought, interesting. When you think of Kairos 20 years from now, what are you seeing, hearing, and feeling? On this call, we have a beautiful cross-section of people. Unfortunately, we are not in person, but for those on camera, it is wonderful to see all of you. So I have a question and I'm hoping we can give 20 to 30 seconds for responses to flow into the chat. My question is, in 2041, we are gathered again. What are we celebrating and speaking about as Kairos's legacy of accomplishment? As you think about that and respond to that, there are so many ways that we can think about that. We heard uh, all of our panelists today speak about their visions for Kairos 20 years from now. It's exhilarating. I ask you to think as you envision for yourself what you think it will look like. How do you feel? Are you inspired? Do you feel ready? Are you exhausted? Because we know that with this work, there's always a lot of work. Are you expectant or excited, motivated, contemplative, provoked to action? Maybe it's all of the above. And how are you feeling? Are you smiling? Are you celebrating? Are you happy when you see us sitting together 20 years from now. I'm feeling all of those things as well. And I thank you if you're putting things in the chat. Now, as we look at all that you are saying, that you are seeing, I want you for a moment to think about who. Who are the leaders of that work? Who are the people in those organizations? Who are the ones informing the way that we're thinking about our world in academia or the leaders of our country? Whose voice do you hear? And whose wisdom and principles and practices are we following 20 years from now? 
in your mind's eye, is our world different? Or do we still need to do that work to shift our gazes and our postures? I have six children, three boys and three girls. They're aged 18 to 30. In my opinion, my estimation, they're brilliant world changers, truly. I raised them to see themselves wherever they wanted to be. And yet while they are going for it, achieving incredible things way before I ever did, pursuing their dreams and fulfilling the prayers and hopes of our ancestors, it is still a hard and encumbering journey. And that hurts. I've had to have the talk with my children, specifically my sons. They're really good children. I shouldn't have to have that talk. They're actually exceptional in every way. And yet the talk, the talks. Why are my children fighting through barriers for the very life and purpose that has been breathed into them? Why are my children still fighting through rhetoric to have the opportunity to bring the solutions and contributions and impact for and to this world that are to be birthed through them? Why? Is it not because all of us here, it is not, sorry, it is not because all of us here do not believe it should be so. It should be easier, not easy but easier, but what should cannot be without changing more than our mindsets. In tandem, we must also confront the systems and every player in those systems. Are we even ready for our children? Our today means that we begin with land acknowledgements, sometimes by rote, not always in posture. Land acknowledgements are good, but only one step. I say this not just to provoke us or challenge us to go deeper in our personal journeys towards transformation, but as a guttural cry to confront, change, and in some cases dismantle differently the very things that our systems are built upon and embedded with that affront human dignity, justice, and more importantly, the premise of love. This is hard work because it will challenge us to move beyond our deeply entrenched comforts. And it asks us to envision a world that we have frankly never seen. It will demand that we move ahead, to the side, to the back, or out of the way, and it will cost us, cost us perhaps what in this moment feels like everything. Yesterday, I presented in another forum, sharing a similar message. Those sessions have also been happening all week, concurrent to our 20th anniversary, and they end tomorrow. I began by saying that I felt great responsibility to bring a message that touches on all the ails and controversies of our current day. COVID-19, the pandemic that has touched the world, where we are experiencing separation from loved ones, communities, our past lives and ways of living, isolation that has deepened concerns of mental health and well-being and incidences of suicide, exacerbation of social injustices and violence that we know are not new concerns, but simply prevailing issues highlighted differently and more desperately division in household, churches and communities about vaccines. What is your status? Has become a question of choice versus responsibility, weighing heavily on our minds, challenging morals, demanding equity and dominating many discourses in media, boardrooms, classrooms and, circle, and circles. The recovery of indigenous children Grave atrocities known yet hidden, recovered, and now what? What are the right words for us to use for our commitment and action? 
accountability, reconciliation, apology, reparations, land back, racism, the other vitriol global pandemic, I cannot breathe, the George Floydian effect, civil rights resurrected with new strategy and strength as we wage war against racism in all its forms, anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, anti-Asian, anti-Semitic, and so on. I said to that group that perhaps the message should be about connecting us through the work of Kairos. As an organization, Kairos through partnership is on the world map, effecting change, addressing concerns of ecological justice and human rights through our work in areas of indigenous rights with the Kairos blanket exercise and responding to the Truth and, Recon the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action through migrant justice, our empowering temporary foreign workers during COVID, through women, peace and security, where we're supporting women towards gender equity, rights and empowerment as they stand as land defenders. But still, I had the question, what is our mission in such a time as this? Is it to look at COVID? Is it indigenous rights? anti-racism, anti-oppression and decolonizing work, Kairos's work. This is the same question I'm posing to all of you. Like I did yesterday, I submit to you today that these are valiant causes, but not the mission. Worthy programs and initiatives, yet not the mission appropriate and necessary considerations for the allocation of our time, effort, and resources, and still not the mission. Because all this work is for what? So we can see a different world. Not only a world where poverty is eradicated, and there is truth and integrity in our systems that stop instances of mass incarceration of indigenous and black bodies, for example. I ask, in your world, your future world, do you easily envision a smudge that begins every meeting like we saw today? Can you see a Black Prime Minister of Canada who is also a woman? Can you envision meetings that do not end with a list of next steps, but regularly end instead in ceremony with respect for the need for further contemplation, with acknowledgement of community and all the voices therein, and deep discernment in anticipation of when we gather again. Do you see a world where people in the streets are gathering for celebration or commemoration and where protests are not needed because protesting is no longer necessary to advance ecological, civil, climate, and human rights. If that's not what you saw 20 years from now, your gaze may be off. Elder Ama said in yesterday's plenary, where are we now? That equality demands assimilation. And I'm paraphrasing that, and I hope I got it right. But she said equality demands assimilation. And that is harmful, that is violence. In a recent workshop for Cairo staff, the facilitator showed a powerful image. It was an image of a black man with his body divided into three errors. The first was the 1800s enslavement and that portion of his body was shown shackled in chains. 
in the middle section, it was uh, 1900s depicting the Jim Crow era. And there was a rope around his neck for lynching. And in the final image, it was a present day representation of the mass incarceration of black men. And he was handcuffed and shackled in that way. This picture, this picture showed us that where, while there have been the actualization of some liberties and human right victories for black men and people, we are still subject to the effect, the same, the same oppression situating us by status within colonial establishments, systems, and institutions with intent and violence and strategy. And herein lies the problem. The generalization of a black man for most will not cause many of us to naturally see him in positions of leadership or success or accomplishment. And if we cannot together, right here, right now, envision Kairos's 40th anniversary, showcasing a different set of characters in the roles with a very different script, we have a problem and our gaze is off. Our staff were asked, can social justice have life within structural and systemic racism? I add oppression and continued emphasis and upheld practice of colonialism. Again, another question I pose here. Because this is where we need our visioning to take us. So we can arrive at a place where all, not just some, have liberty and we are actually different in the way that we think, in the way that we learn, in the way that we hear, in the way that we feel, in the way that we behave, in the way that we do, in our very being. So where are we headed from here? Focused programming? Absolutely. Partners, petitions, and policy work? Yes. Advocacy and activism? Of course. 360 degree leadership and zero tolerance for discrimination, harassment, and violence in any form? Yes. I am five months into my role, and I don't have all the details yet to finalize our strategic plan, to decolonize our workplace, or to fully embed equity through anti-racism and anti-oppression frameworks at Kairos. We will continue to meet the needs we have set out to meet around indigenous rights, migrant justice work, women, peace and security, ecological and climate justice, and all the other things that we do. And we will fulfill our current obligations for sure. The most important work we are doing we are doing, however, is shifting our gaze to become unfettered. The goal is not to move full force ahead status quo, but to instrumentally make small impressions and pivots to not only the way that we do the work, but the way we think about what the work is we need to do. We have made our how and our why, our solutions and our purpose interchangeable, and they're not. They're integrated, perhaps, informing one another, sure, but necessarily distinct. The moment we collapse them indistinguishably, together, we forfeit our gaze and we throw our gaze off to unfortunate long-term consequence. So where are we headed? Into the realm of the unfettered. We are examining our intention versus our impact. We are getting very clear on what our intentions are to make sure that our intentions actually match the impact at every level of the Kairos organization and community. 
The what and how are easy when we accurately define the why. 20 years of spirited action for justice. Yes, but can we be more granular because we do not necessarily have a shared definition for justice across the world. Does justice mean everyone has food sovereignty? Does it mean that our migrant justice workers get a permanent residency? What else does justice mean? I'll end with this, the vision and mission, the current vision and mission for Kairos Canada. The vision, Kairos, Canada will be a diverse, vibrant, collaborative and spiritually rooted movement for ecological justice, human rights and social transformation. I offer you today to look at this vision and think about it in this way. When I see the words will be a diverse, vibrant, collaborative and spiritually rooted movement, I actually think who? That's who Kairos is. That's who we are. When I see for ecological justice, human rights and social transformation, I think what? That's what we do. The mission. Kairos Canada works to build an inclusive movement for solidarity and advocacy that engages in shared action for ecological justice and human rights, strengthens communities and connects people globally across differences in nations. Again, when I read that statement, I break it down again. Kairos Canada works to build an inclusive movement for solidarity and advocacy. How? That's how we work that engages in the shared action for ecological justice and human rights, strengthens communities and connects peoples globally across differences in nations, what we do. Where is our why? Where is the motivation? Where is the vision? And I'm not saying that this is not the right vision, but what I'm challenging us to think about is this, and this is why I'm breaking it down this way. I break down the vision and mission in this manner to compel further thought about whether we believe this articulation of our mission and vision are still accurate. Do they carry the same weight and purpose for the work we are leaning into or need to be leaning into for the next 20 years? Have we achieved these and now need to revisit, amend, and even mature our vision and mission? Five, 10, 15 or 20 years ago, this was the work that was ahead of us. I see that we have made our way here, noting all of our staff, the circles, the community partners, the networks, our friends and supporters who do this work with Kairos right here in this meeting. A diverse, vibrant, collaborative and spiritually rooted movement doing the work we said we do around ecological justice, human rights, and social transformation. So as we look ahead, I ask us all to envision differently. What would we actually see if all of our work is successful? What would we actually see if all our work is successful. This needs to be our vision, clear and plainly. Our mission then follows suit to give us more detail on how we move towards our vision. So I challenge us all today to think about, as we lean into where we are headed, how we are envisioning Kairos when we gather in 2041. What does it look like? Who are the players? Who are the people? What does our earth look like? And I know it's hard to dream that way. I heard it today. We're living in this world where every day seems sometimes insurmountable, where we are exhausted to press forward one more day. As I believe Emily said, to ask someone to, to, to contact their MP one more time. And those are the actions that are necessary because that is what's going to lead us to a world that looks differently. We can expect simply to do all of this work without the world and the people looking differently. And so as you vision 
as you leave from here today, I'm asking you to really close your eyes and to really see. And if there are elements that we know are challenging us today, capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, um, you know, injustice around gender rights, women, um, you know, not embracing as, as was said earlier, um, women, the nurturing spirit and the femininity of women and that divineness that is necessary. If you didn't see that 20 years from now, as we gathered, I'm asking you why? And I'm asking you to go again and start to work through why you didn't see it that way and what is necessary in order for you to envision that kind of world. It is hard because we've never seen it before. And until we do see it, it will be impossible. Aisha, such, such powerful words, Aisha. I'm wondering if we should move up the song and give ourselves time to sit with it. So yes. folks, give me a moment. We'll have the Nietzsche singers. Ani, so the next song we're going to dedicate is a traveling song. A traveling song is, is dedicated for people who have traveled on to the spirit world and as well... Um, gooding, giving good vibes all across Canada for traveling and the people in South America or all over the world. We travel with you in spirit and miigwech. <laughs> I just wanted to um, firstly thank all of the panelists today uh, for your amazing contribution to this final session of our plenary. I also have to give 
great acknowledgement to the Cairo staff. They have been absolutely incredible. I'm always amazed when we jump on meetings like this where there is, um, you know, uh, translation happening and all of that, you know, all of the pieces that led up to this moment, the meetings and the time spent and the coordinating of everyone's schedules and, you know, all of the support that Cairo's um, staff are um, and what they bring to the work that we all get to be a part of is absolutely incredible. And it's such an honor to work with such an amazing group of, of people. And so I want to thank them out loud and in front of everybody. Um, and then we'll thank them as well after the fact. So thank you all for taking the time to join today. As you know, um, we over the last two days have been talking about the work that we do at Kairos and how important it is for us to continue to do this work that you know we are a collective including with you and we don't do this work on our own and so inviting you to stay a part of the work that we are doing and we have different ways that you can contribute to the work of Kairos we have um, an opportunity for everyone to become monthly donors and so we will share information with everybody who is registered and we we ask you to please consider partnering with Kairos um, and I know that you do but please consider and contemplate what that looks like even more so now as we move into this vision for our next 20 years so once again, I thank you so, so very much. I know I didn't get an opportunity to meet everyone because we are attending the gatherings this year virtually, but it has been such an honor to hear the voices and to see all of those who have partnered and walked with Kairos over the last 20 years. And let us be encouraged as we walk into 20 more of spirited action for justice.